Welcome to the Whole Enchilada, a community of high achievers that fight the status quo, rebel against mediocrity, and make life happen. Let's go. Hey, Enchilada Nation, excited uh, for the conversation we're going to have. It's actually an economic conversation. I invited three of my good friends and some of the smartest people I know that are constantly analyzing the market in their current uh, areas to have the discussion with us in regards to the global economy, the national economy, and how do we drive that into our local economies and operate as entrepreneurs. So this is a three-part episode. I hope you enjoy it. Lean into the conversation. I would love to hear your feedback on what you believe the market's going to do. All right, everybody. Um, I am. We're going to jump right into this today because we uh, have a couple special guests on, and we have an hour to cover a lot of information. Um, when I was talking to to Russie and Eden about this uh, and Michelle a couple weeks ago, um, and we're thinking about what what should be the conversation for the Masters of Real Estate Club right now. Um, and I know we talk a lot about the economy. We do the quarterly market update, but you hear a lot from me and my perspective on it. Uh, and frankly, when you hear me and think how smart I am, it's because I surround myself by great people that are much smarter than I am. And I'm just retelling you what they're telling me. Uh, but one of my favorite things to do is actually to almost debate things out a little bit to help me shape my thought process around it, which then I can then turn into actionable items, either conversations with my people or a way for me to take action uh, in, in serving the consumer and building my business. And so today I want to do a quick introduction to uh, some, some very dear friends of mine and special guests that I'm really excited to share with you guys today. And then what we're going to do is for this conversation, we're going to have everyone on mute. And ultimately, uh, uh, Johnny, Joe, Dane, and I are going to have an economic debate about what we think is going to happen both on a global scale, uh, a local, uh, a U.S. scale, and then get down into our local markets a little bit. And then how does that apply to our real estate businesses? Um, so if, with, uh, if there's no other uh, thought process there before we jump in, um, I'm just going to do a quick intro for each one of my partners here that is here with me today. Uh, number one, you guys already know Johnny. Johnny Christensen, uh, incredible uh, man. I'm thinking of all the nice things I can say about you, Johnny. Uh, like RD, you guys know on and on. I'm a little disappointed. Johnny told me he was going to wear glasses today, did not wear glasses. And so everything he says today is a little bit less smart than it would have been had he worn glasses. Um, Joe Martin, Joe and I uh, built a relationship uh, over the last couple of years and have just been overly impressed with, with how Joe thinks, very thoughtful, how he approaches the market. And I like that uh, he's one of those people that think through things before he speaks, which I think is unique in our industry right now, where most people just want to be heard. So they speak before they think. And I think Joe's just done a great job of like really pensive about like, what is the impact of the words I'm going to, I'm going to say. So I really appreciated from your perspective, Joe, Joe runs a couple of regions on the East coast and multiple other things uh, that you guys can jump into if you want. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, uh, Dana Gentry, thank you for being on. I'm so grateful for uh, our friendship that we're building. And one thing that I've just been so impressed with you on is your ability to just bring energy and light to any conversation. And it shows not just like in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but the amount of people that just think so highly of you. Like as I travel around the country and your name comes up, it just, it, people glow when they talk about you, which just makes me proud to call you a friend. And you're a phenomenal leader, multiple market center owner, um, host of a, a, a podcast, which we can promote out a little bit. Um, but anyway, without going on and on about that, let's jump into the conversation. Um, let's start with uh, econo uh, global economics. Uh, Johnny, or excuse me, Joe, we're going to start with you with more of a global economic uh, conversation. Where do you want to start? Let's start high level on this. So, Joe, I have just, I'll throw this out there. I live out uh, Virginia, West Virginia is my territories as a regional director. And then I've got ownership in five market centers, eight locations with over a thousand agents. My business partner is Bo Minkiti. Um, I've held every leadership role inside of KW. So MCA, front desk, team leader, uh, investor, and then operator for a lot of a couple of our market centers. Um, and the biggest part about like, I had a finance degree. So a lot of the stuff I was excited when Marcus brought this up, I was like, going into global economics and sometimes be boring. So you can take numbers, but what do those numbers actually mean? And I think for this group of uh, the top tier that you've got on here for production, like understanding the global economics and what's going on and like how that plays into the US economy. Um, so what I wanted to start with was um, so I'll screen share here. Um, 
I've got host disabled participant screen shares whenever you get that one, but not to slow down the conversation. I've got um, the growth projections for the entire global economy. You got it. Now. And bring this one up here. Now, when you look at these numbers to kind of give it is that for the world, this is GDP, right? So when you look at growth in our entire globe, you're talking about gross domestic product. And in the world, they're showing 2022 was 3.5% year-over-year increase in GDP. 2023 would be a 3% increase year-over-year. 2024, they're projecting a 3% increase year-over-year, right? Well, okay, so you got a 3% growth. That's That sounds great. It means you got some people that are employed. You got products going out. The big thing you see here is advanced economies versus emerging economies. So when you look into hyper like dissecting, the U.S. economy, the Euro, uh, Europe, um, Japan, they usually fall under advanced economies, right? Um, that, that's where they kind of see. Emerging economies are usually like Southeast Asia. Sometimes they bucket in India and China. It just depends on how they're looking at it. For the IMF, they're, they're going to bucket those into there. So what's interesting as you look at what affects us personally with our trade within um, G7, you have advanced economies that are actually going to have slower GDP year over year growth than those of like emerging markets. So you're seeing that they're anticipating 1.5% year over year GDP growth in this year for 2023, 1.4 in 2024, and then emerging markets are showing much higher, right? Um, there's a couple different reasons behind this, but before we go any farther, like, when I say this, Marcus, Johnny, Dana, like, what are your questions or what are you seeing as like, why? Because I can get into like indications of why this is happening, but what's your first overall thing when I say this? I mean, what, what are my thoughts on this? I think I, I love this is broken down because it's interesting. Historically speaking, emerging markets and de developing economies have tracked behind advanced economies. Um, and you see that's the exact opposite. Now, from your perspective, is that is that because we've overgrown as advanced economies or is it now becoming a, a creating a more equal playing field across countries like there's more countries that are going to be deemed as like advanced uh economies over the next couple of years because i i think a lot of people are targeting the u.s where we used to be such a powerhouse compared to the rest of the world are people catching up to us or are we are we tracking backwards um I think it's a combination of a lot of stuff. I can't think, I think partly I'll start with this one. The total global debt sits at 307 trillion. So the issue behind it, and I'm sure Johnny will get into this on the US side of like debt and savings. The issue is, is that it, that 307 trillion is not consumer debt, it's government debt. So when you have that much government, like the majority of it's government issued debt, and when you don't have a gold backed currency like the US dollar, you run into an issue where you just issue money out. So those are looking at like what's happening with an impending shutdown on September 30th is that the Biden administration is trying to push a $24 billion expenditure to Ukraine, right? Well, they're getting, you've got the Republican Party has a riff right now because there's some hardliners that are saying we need a budget and I'm not going to do a continuance. To like keep the economy rolling because no one's holding to a budget. So I think a lot of what you're seeing in enhanced economies is that we've got such a high debt now. And when they, when the Fed starts raising it between 5.25 and 5.5, the U.S. government has to pay interest on that debt. So it's not just consumer debt and private debt. They're issuing debt and then they're going to have to pay a higher rate on that. So you're actually having hindrance on where they can de deploy capital, whether it's military, infrastructure, um, Social Security, these type of things. So you actually are seeing that because the U.S. economy is a consumption-based economy, you've got so much debt, the increased interest payments are taken away from infrastructure investment and consumption. That's why I see advanced economies having an issue because you're having the same issue in the U.K. Interesting. Johnny, thoughts? I, well, I wonder even if there's just a simple factor in here is just our ability to repopulate, you know, our countries, right? Like it's almost like a market center when the market goes down, we can even out recruit sometimes our drop in productivity, you know, and uh, a lot of more advanced economies, so I guess uh, the the better it's going and the comfier we get, the, the more we realize kids are hard. <laughs> so we, we, maybe we stop having them or yeah. something, but I'm sure that has a factor because third world countries typically outproduce uh, more advanced civilizations. Interesting point. Dane, any thoughts on that or questions? 
Yeah, I'm laughing because you asked me to talk about how to grow their business and happiness. And I'm like, <laughs> I was the person to talk about on that because I don't watch a lot of the news anymore, just to be totally transparent um, because of the, <laughs> the the places that we've been in. However, I do study the markets and especially locally. And I think we've we've gotten so far out of whack from all of the global things that nationally we've gotten out of whack on. The one thing that I always coach my agents to to remember is 2246. If you can remember the numbers 2246, we want in a grit in a in a normal market inside of our country regardless of what's happening globally if we have gdp around 2% inflation around 2% real estate appreciation around 4% and unemployment below 6% we're in a good we're in a good place and when those numbers are out of whack which a lot of things globally have to play to those numbers being out of whack but some of it's our own our own fault internally in the us too but when those numbers are really out of whack everything feels out of whack. And that's what we felt for the last, you know, couple of years. That's my take on it. Yeah. Interesting. I, I like that as a rule that two, two, four, six th makes things simple. Joe, one of the questions I have for you is if you look historically at, at recessionary times or lead up to recessionary times uh, in the U S as it relates to the rest of the world, when things are, our money's flowing, things are good we tend to outsource a lot more things to foreign countries, right? Whether it's imports or services or things like that. And then we've been forced into, which which pushes their economies, right? We're, we're helping their economy grow while things are getting a gluttonous in our country. And then we get forced into this idea of like, should we just be building this at home? Like, let's revert it back to the country to push our own economy. And we kind of do this cycle. Like, where do you think we're at in that cycle? And do you think that's affecting our relation with what's going on with the rest of the country? Uh, yeah, I think it's that, you know, from cost of labor, I mean, you've got issues with like, you know, the inflationary stuff, right? So if you look at, let me show you this, this slide on core inflation across the U.S. Give me one second. Um, this is interesting. So it actually breaks it down by like country. So you've got the U.S., United States is at harmonized core CPI inflation rates. You know, you, you're trending at like 3.6, but you can see Europe from Euro area as well as Germany are up at like 7.5, right? So percentage changes over a 12 month period. So you're seeing us kind of go down and get into like a 6.8% and you're seeing Europe kind of go up, right? So the thing that I'm seeing on that one is just like your cost of living is higher in the US because it's just inflationary costs and whatnot, and you know, supply chains. So you have a higher labor cost. Well, then what happens is there's a subsector of like, you know, unskilled labor that needs to happen that's at a lower price point. So you have profit margins. And in the US, we have basically outsourced all of our industry so that there is no labor force that wants to do that work. Right. It's like, I don't want to do that. I want to be service. I want to be customer service. I want to provide a service, a broker, the thing. And I think our biggest opportunity inside the US is to bring back some of that manufacturing. Because if you actually look at what's happening, um, I don't know if anybody's seen this, but like the Canadian <laughs> prime minister basically laid down a gauntlet of war with India because there's claims that the India uh, sent uh, hitmen to Canada to take out a uh, psych. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the word on this one, but it was a uh, defect psych um, or seek on Canadian ground. So right now, when you look at like where most manufacturing is happening is China and India. That's literally where all like the unskilled labor is and manufacturing is coming out of. So you basically took Canada and the guy goes, well, we know that they sent a hitman over here to kill a defect sect, seek, and now there's going to be international challenges with that. So if you're trying to think also going into talking about China's manufacturing is um, the, oh, I got this number here. So Europe the trade deficit just with Europe, I couldn't find it for the US, but the trade deficit from what they send to China versus what they receive from China in the year in the UK and in, in EU, there's a $400 billion euro deficit, meaning they sent $865 billion worth or billion dollars of euro to China and only received, you know, 465 billion back. So the issue with that is there's such a, there needs to be a de-risking, meaning like if so much of that import business is heavy to China, you basically have, they've controlled a monopoly inside the UK and like the, the European Union. So yes, to, to answer your question long-winded is that there's numbers that show that all manufacturing is coming from China. 
So I, you know, if you want to do conspiracy theory, why is it that every other country in the world lifted the COVID bans, but China didn't? Well, they didn't because they controlled supply. So they can then artificially drive up pricing because you don't have another outlet to, to get the manufacturing from, which is why there's been such an investment in India because they can actually start getting the same manufacturing there and not have the price inflation that China is basically artificially causing by supply, but constraining the supply chain. Sorry, yeah. long winded. But like this no, is I, just I, I think I, I think one of the things that, uh, and to Dana's point earlier, this idea of I don't watch the news anymore is, I, I I think we all need to look at anything we hear from a news article standpoint. Is there some some agenda happening behind the news story? Yeah. Right. So it's this idea, like even and, and again, not to turn this into into a political debate or anything like that, but you look at like even some of the arguments that are being made around the the war between Russia and Ukraine on a national level and what that means. Is it is there uh, is that conflict really what it, the news portrays it about or is it a diversion for other things economically? And so there's things like that to be watching. The other the other one of my biggest concerns from a global perspective that I'd love to give your guys' take on is historically speaking, the, the US dollar has been the power source currency forever that the world's looked at. And I think you you now have uh, China, who you just gave a great uh, uh, example of, who we're all sending our dollars over there, which is empowering their dollar. And then they figured out now that it's not just their their dollar on its own, but if they they figured out if hey, if a couple of us group together, are we more powerful? Our new currency versus the U.S. dollar. And if, if they pull that off, what does that do for the little green pieces of paper we all walk around with? Yeah, I'm. I'm there's been, nice been a lot of late night uh, conspiracy theory paths I've gone down, no doubt. You know, the, the whole BRICS, you know, creating a currency like I, I don't really see a path forward. Uh, a, I, I've realized that it, it'll probably take longer than uh, the news and the media and, and the world thinks it would take to destabilize a specific currency. I do think there's probably some cooperation we could do a little bit better from our part, uh, but it definitely has benefited us economically the last you know, decades uh, being the reserve currency everywhere. You know, even my involvement down in Argentina, their real estate market fully operates in the dollar still. It's a very big benefit for our dollar. So I think any sort of destabilization around the planet, I don't know how it would not have a negative effect for us. So I do think that is a big concern that we got to pay attention, but we probably got to be a better, you know, global citizen to some degree too, to make sure that doesn't happen. So... That, I think that's a great point of like how how have we been perceived as a global citizen v before where we were kind of leading the pack where a lot of countries don't look at us the same way they used to for for a myriad of reasons uh, politics our economy where other economies now becoming less dependent on us in some ways from for, for certain things uh, so I, I I do think that's really interesting to consider uh, one one quick caveat on that just to get your guys's take on that like as I think through this for my own investment portfolio. Um, I, I just really believe where there's been so much cash floating around that the assets we choose from an investment standpoint become really critical to protect regardless of what happens with our dollar is I still believe the product we sell as a group is regardless in the future if people are paying rent with cryptocurrency or yen or whatever it is, is they'll still need to pay me something to rent a, a home that will have value here locally, as opposed to if, if I have all my money in cash or, or liquid cash assets or, or even, even in the banks, if they pull that off in a significant way, my net worth significantly increases if I don't have that allocated correctly, which converts to the value in relation to the new currency, if it is a new currency. Any thoughts on that? I'm happy. Go ahead, Dana. I can follow up. No, here. I was just going to say, I I totally agree with that. I agree with everything Johnny said. I don't know enough on it to speak super intelligently about it. I do think that it's something that with the businesses that we're all in, we need to pay attention to. Yet, I think it would take a long time for something like that to actually come to existence. However, I mean, you know, I guess never, never say never, but I do think now let me preface by saying I'm from Kentucky, so we might operate a little different <laughs> than what you all are used to, but I have a, I have a group of girlfriends, one of them's here right now, and we all keep a lot of cash at our houses because at some point in the last two years, we've gone to the bank to get cash out and we've had to drive to three or four different branches to get that amount of cash out, which to me is, a you know, is sometimes a little concerning. So I think you just have to really pay attention pay attention to that and and watch it but i do think you know i heard gary say that that was back in 
February of this year, I believe that it was one of the top three concerns that that he had um, was potentially the cur- the currency changing nas- um, globally. But I, I do think it would take a long time. I agree with Johnny. Okay, hey, Johnny, oh. bring, bring us a little more home local. Oh, unless Joe, did you have a comment there? Yeah, I think Johnny, like you've got a topic on BRICS and G7. So I, I wanted to give this call some deep like understanding what that is, like what we're talking about. So G7 is the alliance of like an economic cohort is the best way to describe it. So G7 is Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, and the US, right? So when you heard the term BRICS, it actually stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And it's basically a rival financial thing. And what they're they're adding the following countries to BRICS in 2024 is Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. So the challenge that you have there is that those those countries represent roughly 27% of all like GDP, right? And that, that that's if you can actually track it at like the IMF level via the International Monetary Fund. So that the challenge that you're running into is that your banking system operates on SWIFT. So the way it, it's an acronym I can't remember what it stands for, but it's your settlement for like ACHs and how money transfers through banks. So they're actually going forward with a company called Ripple as the system and the coin that they're working off of is XRP. So what happens is, is if you basically long-term, if you they're trying to look at how do I not have the US dollar as the primary currency for all transactions? Because if they're not relying on the US currency, then you don't have control. There's a quote by I think Teddy Roosevelt that says, the who controls the monetary system controls all power. So there's there's real, I would have, it might take years, but like that's a real concern because they're basically saying, how do I get out of final, because if the real issue with China is their defaults on um, massive real estate projects. Because the people that hold the debt on the massive real estate projects in China are your venture capital based out of New York. Yeah, so they start defaulting on those. You're going to have an issue inside of your New York stock exchange. And and uh, did you guys t- tap me down a little bit if you think differently. But the you look at these are other advanced economies. These aren't just like unadvanced economies that are saying like, hey, let's kind of bound, bind together. These are advanced economies that historically have relied somewhat on on the U.S. powerhouse for their own economies to grow. And I, I feel like a part of this play is specifically targeting the U.S. Uh, of saying like, hey, we're it's we don't want you to, to necessarily be on the throne anymore as the number one uh, a global economy. Uh, it it is there's some element of a target play on this. It, it, do you think I'm out of out of whack saying that? No, I don't think you are. I think they're basically saying like you're seeing alliances happen. For, for economic purposes. And they're saying like, hey, like for instance, what's really scary or not scary, but concerning is BRICS, the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court System for like the entire world, issued a warrant for Putin to the BRICS because they had a summit. And BRICS was like, nah, we're not doing anything about that. Interesting. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you for uh, leaning into the conversation. Uh, I am so grateful for uh, my dear friends leaning in and giving me their insight on what's going on in the economy. I hope that you learned something from the conversation and took away a couple nuggets. Now the idea is how do you utilize that information to go improve your current situation and have a conversation with the people in your world. And as always, don't forget, go live life on your terms.